Thank you, Evan. Um, so yeah, if we've used that single source to all destination algorithm, we're only going to have to call it two end times if we had end pickups and deliveries. Uh, so that's not too many, 200 for a pretty big case. Uh, we're also going to need to call it a few more times for the depots from any depot to any delivery location. So your depot is another possible source, start point basically. You would invoke Dijkstra's algorithm from that start point to every interesting intersection. So again, that's all the delivery locations. That's another M calls because there's only M start points for that. And then when we want to drop off the, the truck, we also need to know what is the travel time from any delivery location, because we might, we might have ended at any drop off location to any depot. So we can choose what's the closest depot. Uh, we can actually do that with zero calls because we can get that from this earlier call. If we basically, when we're doing our single source to all destinations, if we record the travel time, not just to the pickups and drop offs, but also to the depots, then we'll actually already have the answer of from any delivery location, what's the travel time to a depot. Okay, so the number of pathfinding calls we need to make has dropped greatly. We now have to make 210 calls versus before it was about 40,000. Um, and our pathfinding algorithm is not much more complicated. It basically just has to not stop when it hits one intersection that is the target. It has to be able to keep going and uh, find the path to all the intersections, but it's not much code change to do that. Okay, um, there's another trick that you can think of if you want to reduce this uh, even more. Um, so we actually, to go from any depot, this first call, to uh, any delivery location, you can actually use a, what's called a multi-source to all destinations uh, form of Dijkstra's algorithm. So you start at multiple spots and you find the path to multiple destinations. It's again, not much code change and uh, you're already um, possibly building an algorithm like that for milestone three. And if you use that slightly different pathfinding algorithm, uh, you can actually do this part with just one call. Okay, so we can get this down to 201 path searches, which is a lot better than 40,000. Okay, so let's see, is that fast enough? So each one of these path searches is still Dijkstra's algorithm, um, but it's what's called a, you know, there's slightly different variations on Dijkstra's algorithm. Do I start at one spot or do I start from multiple spots? Do, am I going to one destination or am I searching to until I hit multiple destinations? So we've got N nodes in the graph and we've got K destinations. We've got K pickup or drop off intersections that we want to find paths to. So we're going to invoke this. The most important uh, path search algorithm I just talked about is the from one source, so a single source to multiple destinations. And we have K destinations. Um, so what is the complexity of that? And I'm going to try a new to me Zoom feature of a poll. So let me launch a poll. And hopefully you can all see that. So, Abid, can you see this? So, Abid, can you see this poll? Oh, yes, I can see. Okay, so what I'm asking you is, what is the complexity of Dijkstra's algorithm? Uh, where well, we're starting at one source, so one intersection, and we're trying to find the path to K different destination intersections. Those K intersections are basically all the ones that are interesting in this traveling salesman. They're all the pick up and drop off intersections, uh, or they might include the depot intersections as well. But let's just say that's K. Uh, and the size of the graph is gonna matter. The graph has N intersections. So uh, let's take a minute and, uh, and vote on this. And then momentarily, I'm going to uh, end the, the poll and you'll be able to see what everybody think. Okay, and let me also clarify one thing. So I'm asking you for just one invocation of Dijkstra's algorithm here. So from one source to all of the uh, interesting uh, destinations. Um, there's 
Now I'm going to have to invoke this algorithm multiple times. I'm going to have to start with every uh, one of my pickup or drop off uh, intersections. So I will have to run this multi-destination Dijkstra algorithm k times. Uh, but I'm asking you just for one, one run of it, okay? From one source intersection to the k destination intersections, what is the complexity? And you will actually, if you use this technique, have to start this search k different times. All right, so I'm gonna end the polling so you guys can all see this. Uh, so the winner in terms of popularity is k times n log n. Uh, but the actual answer is uh, n log n. And let's see if I can open up a chat window again here to see if anyone's uh, chatting. Okay. Um, so yeah, basically for Dijkstra's algorithm, going from a single source to one intersection, one target intersection, in the worst case, you have to explore the whole graph. We'll actually show you the, the logic of by which we get here. So Dijkstra's algorithm can search the whole graph in the worst case. And if we're actually going to multiple destinations, it's usually going to be pretty close to that worst case. It is actually going to search through the whole graph because we're looking for a lot of different destinations. So that means we've got order n items to put into the wavefront. We're going to go through every single node in the graph, put it in the wavefront, let the wavefront sort it. We're using an efficient wavefront. So we're using a heap or a priority queue or a binary search tree, something that sorts efficiently, which is logarithmic in n. So that means n log n. Um, and it, so the answer is n log n. It's not k n log n because that's the beauty of this multi-destination Dijkstra. We just keep throwing everything into the wavefront and eventually we'll hit all of our destinations. And then if you go back and you look at the best time you stored for every single one of those destinations, it's correct, okay? So it found the minimum travel time from that starting point to all of those K destinations, and it actually only explored the graph once. And that's why it's much, much more efficient than doing a whole bunch of independent path searches where you're looking just for one uh, destination at a time. Uh, does that make sense? Uh, what this means is that this isn't much slower than just the find a path from one, one source to one destination, which is what you wrote as the main function in milestone three, the uh, driving path function uh, for uh, the driving only path find. So if this takes also about 0.1 seconds, then even for big problems where you have maybe 200 interesting intersections, uh, like pickups and drop offs, then this is gonna take maybe 20 seconds and it's gonna be fine. You can use this more advanced technique to get better travel times, use that in your optimization of delivery orders. Uh, any questions on that? Or is that pretty clear? Okay, I'm gonna take that as it's pretty clear. So I don't see anybody raising their hand. Okay, so that was all about getting travel times. We, we have delivery orders and we're trying to decide what's a good delivery order versus a bad delivery order. And to do that, we need to quickly find travel times. So that was all about how can we get more accurate travel times by pre-computing in an efficient way, um, path-based travel times rather than just using geometric approximations. Okay, so our first heuristic was, was greedy. It was gonna use those estimates of delay or travel time between different intersections. And we we're always gonna make whatever decision seemed best um, right now, greedily, uh, in terms of what intersection to go to next. We would go to essentially the closest intersection that was legal. Okay, so how can we get more quality? You have 45 seconds per problem, uh, per test case for milestone four. And there's no bonus for returning an answer early. Basically, you can use all of that 45 seconds. You don't wanna use any more than it. So how, and the greedy algorithm that we talked about is gonna be pretty fast. It, uh, now that we figured out how to do good path searches to give it uh, good travel time information, it is gonna be very fast. So how can we spend some more of that 45 seconds to get better results? Um, and I don't wanna write much more code. So I'm gonna give you my answer, which is something you can use with pretty much any algorithm. So all these algorithms are imperfect, they're called heuristics. So we can, we can do something called multi-start. We can say, we know our algorithm is not perfect. If we just start it in, and make it make some different decisions and then take the best answer it ever got, then we could get a better result. 
And it's pretty easy to code this and it can be added on to any other algorithm that you've already written. Okay, so for our greedy algorithm that we just came up with last, uh, last lecture, we could basically just try it multiple times and then take the best answer that it ever got. Okay, but we need it to get a different answer. If we just run it multiple times with exactly the same inputs, we don't change anything, it's just gonna give us the same answer a thousand times if we run it a thousand times. And taking the best of those is not gonna help us in any way. So we need to make it get a different answer. So we need to change it somehow. So there are a few things we could do. We, the, the greedy algorithm we came up with at the end of last lecture basically started at the depot that was closest to some pickup. We wanted to minimize that first travel time, going from a depot to a pickup. We could just say, we're not gonna do that. We're gonna say, uh, we're gonna try a different depot when we run the algorithm again. And that'll make all the other, all the other decisions different. Um, for example, we could start it with the second smallest travel time from a depot to a pickup. That'll make uh, the algorithm behave differently. Um, we could do things like have a 10% chance of taking the second smallest travel time when we're choosing the next delivery. So the greedy algorithm that we wrote last class always took, it always went to the closest pickup or drop off that was legal uh, in terms of travel time. We could say 90% of the time it does that, but 10% it goes to the second uh, closest, second smallest travel time of anything that's legal. And that's gonna make it get a different answer. Um, and there are libraries to give you random numbers. So you can basically make it give you a different random number uh, every time you, you call a certain function. And you can use that to, to have the program basically 90% of the time make one decision and 10% make a different decision. Uh, and every time you went through your algorithm, you'd have some chance of making a different decision, getting a different answer. Uh, and there are lots of other things. So somehow add randomness or different starting points to the algorithm so that it comes up with different answers the more times you run it. Okay, so this is our heuristic from last week. Uh, and again, it, it starts off by looking at all the depots. Here we've got three depots and it's gonna choose which one has the smallest travel time to some pickup. In that case, it's this depot to this pickup. So it's gonna start off by going there. Then it looks at what's the smallest travel time to the next legal thing. So next legal thing it could do, it could pick up B or it could drop off A. So it's gonna go drop off A because it's a smaller travel time. Um, next legal thing it can do, it can't drop off B because it doesn't have it yet. So it has to go pick up B and then it drops off B. And lastly, it's gonna go to the closest depot. Okay, so it gets that answer. Um, but unfortunately you can see there's a fair amount of backtracking. So this was not the best uh, solution we could have gotten. So rather than trying to do something really clever, we're just gonna run this algorithm again. So we need to make it do something different. So we have enough CPU time, we're gonna run it again, uh, and we're gonna make it start on the second best depot. So in that, this case, uh, let's say the second best depot is this one. So from this depot to that uh, pickup is the second smallest travel time that you could have from a depot to a pickup. So we start there. Once we do that, we go to the next closest um, intersection where we can do something as legal. So we can pick up A, we go there. And now we can go to the next closest intersection that's interesting, that's A, drop it off, go to B, drop it off, finally go to the closest depot. We actually got rid of the backtracking. This is actually a much uh, lower travel time solution, even though the first decision didn't look quite as good. So. This first decision was longer travel time to get to the first pickup, but it worked out better in the end. And for a complicated problem like this courier optimization, you can't actually tell um, what's the best decision to make at any point in time. You know, you have heuristics, you have guesses, uh, like just do what seems to be the smallest travel time of the next thing you can do, but you don't know what impact that's gonna have in your overall solution. So in this case, by making a suboptimal decision early, we got a better final result. And we didn't try to apply any real cleverness to that. We just said, we'll just try a lot of different things until we are running out of CPU time and we'll take the best answer of any of the things that we found. Uh, and this is a, this multi-start technique is something you can apply to any algorithm. So it can always get you more quality if you have more CPU time available to run it. So any questions on that?
Okay, so that sounds good. So let's go on to our third heuristic. So we started with greedy, and we moved on to multi-start, which can be layered on top of any algorithm. And now let's talk about iterative improvement. Um, so iterative improvement, so greedy algorithms, well, what we, what we did with our first set of algorithms are what are called greedy constructive algorithms. So they're greedy because they always do what seems to be immediately best without a lot of foresight about what happens later. They don't ever back up and change a decision. And they're constructive because they're basically just building a solution from start to finish and they never go back and undo anything. So they make a decision of what's the depot to start at, what's the first pickup, what's the next thing, et cetera. And they just keep adding it in until they get a complete solution. So that's called a constructive algorithm. Iterative improvement algorithms are a little different. They start with a complete solution and they just look to see, can I make some changes to make it better? And that can be a very powerful technique where you can see the whole solution you have so far. And now that you're done, you go back and look and see, is there anything I don't like about it? Maybe I could tweak it a bit. Um, so it'd be very nice to have this in your, in your life where you could uh, complete some course or some big task. And then once you're completely done, you've handed it in, you've got your grade back, you're actually allowed to go back and say, what might I want to change? So that's what iterative algorithms can do. Okay, so here's a little test case again. We start at the depot, we go pick up this delivery, drop it off, uh, and so on. Okay, so let's say we've started with our greedy algorithm that we wrote before, and it constructs this solution by just following along of what's the smallest travel time to the next thing I could do. All right, so I'm gonna basically, I'm gonna simplify the representation of this. So it's all in a city map, but I don't wanna show the whole path anymore. I'm just gonna show you uh, essentially the interesting intersections and they're connected by edges and marked on the edges is the trap, on each edge is the travel time to go from one intersection to the other. Okay, so this is a representation of that solution I just showed you. Started a depot, got a little bit of travel time, uh, say two minutes to get to this pickup, then a little more travel time, say four minutes to get to that drop off and so on. And eventually I end up at this depot again. And the total travel time of the solution I showed you is 81 minutes. Okay, so now I want to try to improve that with iterative improvement. So I'm going to change something. And usually the changes are local. So I, I don't try to change everything at once because usually that's too disruptive. It destroys my solution and my solution is not bad. That greedy algorithm hopefully came up with kind of a reasonable solution. So I don't want to just throw it away. What I'd like to do is just tweak it and then see if it's better. Okay, so how could I, how could I tweak this? Um, and, oh, actually I see one, let me go back quickly to, there's a question of how do you determine which depot is best or second best for the uh, multi-start? Uh, so the way I was, I was determining what was best is essentially it's the starting depot. And I was defining the best depot to be the one that had the smallest travel time to some pickup, because I'll have the shortest start of my path. And the second best is the depot that has the second uh, well, basically has the second shortest travel time to some pickup. So that was how I was defining second best and best for that multi-start. So going back though to local perturbation, anyone in the line have an idea, how could we perturb this in a small way? Okay, so I don't want a perturbation where you say, well, just rip up all of these edges, which are essentially the travel paths we're using and just redo them all, because that means that's basically multi-start. That means just start again do it completely over again, make the algorithm make different decisions. I don't want to do that. I like the solution. I just want to tweak it and see if the tweak is good. So what, what's a simple local tweak that you could do? We'll see if anybody has any ideas on this. Okay, so it looks like maybe nobody does. So I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to propose one. Uh, so the smallest local perturbation that I can think of is just to swap the order of two of the intersections in this uh, courier path. So here I'm dropping off uh, B and then I'm dropping off C. So I could say, we'll just do that in the opposite order, which means I go uh, from this node where I was picking up C to this intersection where I drop off C and then I go drop off D. So let me go backwards again so you can see it. So I used to at the very end of my travel, my courier solution, I would drop off B, 
and then drop off the C delivery and then I go to a depot and I basically swapped the order of those two drop offs. So now I drop off C first and then I drop off B first or drop off B second. Okay, so I made a change to my travel path. I need to see if it's good or not. So I want to recompute its travel time. Well, first I need to check if it's legal. Um, and this one is legal. I'm still picking up C before I drop off C. I'm still picking up B before I drop off B. Um, but in some cases, it might not be legal. I also have to check if this is still underneath the uh, capacity of the truck. You know, do I ever have too many things on the truck? In this case, let's say it's also okay. So if it's legal, I can compute the new travel times. Okay, so I'm now using some different paths through my street map. I go from the C pickup to the C drop off. I go from the C drop off to the B drop off. Using the techniques that I, well, you, there are multiple ways to compute that, but the best way to do it is what I just showed you. If you've invoked um, your pathfinding algorithm and you've done it as a multi-destination Dijkstra's algorithm, you could pre-compute uh, all of these travel times that are interesting uh, in, between all of these uh, intersections I'm showing. So you can just look up very quickly, what is the travel time from C pickup to C drop off? Those are two intersections, just look up what their travel time is. Um, and maybe that was 23 minutes and maybe the travel time from here to here is 14 minutes. So I've marked those in. Okay, so I compute the new travel time and it's actually faster. Uh, so that's better than my old travel time of 81. So I update my solution. Okay, so I've got a better, I've got a better solution. That was a useful thing to do. Okay, so what about a more powerful perturbation? So what I just showed you is perfectly reasonable. And in fact, generally will improve your quality if you do it. Um, but it also is only perturbing a little bit. So it, it can't make big changes. And I said making huge changes where you throw everything away is probably not a great idea. It's kind of like multi-start, but I might want a bigger change than that. Um, and for traveling salesmen, well, there's a classic set of perturbations for this problem, which is a variation on traveling salesmen that actually work quite well. I don't know if anybody has heard of them. I'll give a second to see if anybody in the chat or, or wants to jump in with a more powerful perturbation. Okay, so I don't see anybody with one. So I'm gonna tell you what another one is. Okay, um, so it's more radical perturbation. There are lots you could come up with, but a pretty powerful one for this kind of algorithm is called uh, two opt. So two opt means two edge operation. You delete two connections in this courier path. Okay, so what does that mean? Let's say I eliminated, let me go back here so you can see it more slowly. Okay, so let's say I eliminate that connection and where's the other one? Okay, so basically I'm gonna eliminate this connection and this connection. Those two are gonna be eliminated. Okay, so you see they disappear. Now this is no longer actually a valid solution. I haven't gone, I haven't gone between all of the pickups and drop-offs, so I've got to reconnect it somehow. Um, and you can reconnect it in a different way. Okay, so I'm now going from this intersection to that intersection, from this intersection to that intersection. So it looks different. It's been reconnected in a different way. It's actually not legal. You can see that this, I'm going along this path and I get here and then suddenly I'm going the wrong way. So it's not quite legal. So you have to reconnect the path uh, and then legalize it. Okay, so I may have to reverse the order of part of the path. So this one, I was going from here to here. That doesn't make sense anymore. I now need to go the other way. And I need to uh, fix up the depots. See, at this point, uh, I'm trying to go to a depot in the middle of the path. I shouldn't do that. So I have to get rid of that. And I have to put the depot in at the actual end of the path. So I go there. Um, so this is, again, called a two-op. It's a more complex uh, perturbation, but it's more powerful. Okay, now I recalculate the travel time. Uh, in this case, I'm kind of making these travel times up, but it turns out that this is 70 minutes, so it's better than my previous 71. So uh, it's a better solution. I'm gonna update my solution to be this new one. If the travel time was worse, I wouldn't update. I would just say that was a, not a good perturbation, don't do it. Go on, try the next perturbation. And these iterative, iterative improvement algorithms are most powerful when your perturbation is pretty fast. If your perturbation is pretty fast, you can try 
thousands, hundreds of thousands, even millions of perturbations. Um, so it doesn't actually matter if 99% of them are not very good. Um, if 1% of them are good and you try a million perturbations, you will find a lot of improvements. Uh, so you don't have to worry about making them extremely smart. Uh, if you're fast and you can try a lot of them, you can still get good improvements. Okay, so anything else? Um, so I just showed you how to do this two off at a high level. I'm gonna show you a little more in another couple of slides. Um, and I showed you, you have to kind of re, you delete a couple of edges and then you have to reconnect things. In classic traveling salesman, you're done. But for us, we also have to check if the path we created is still legal. So we have to check if we picked up a package before dropping it off. And we have to check that we don't over overload the truck. So we need some legality code. And if our perturbation made things illegal, uh, the easiest thing to do is just say, don't do it. I'm immediately reject it. Okay, in traveling salesmen, classic traveling salesmen, uh, where you just have to go through N cities in some order, uh, or N intersections in some order, two up works very well. In the problem we've given you, you've got these extra legality constraints. You have to pick things up before you drop them off, and there's a capacity limit on the or weight capacity limit on the truck. So that may mean that you get get less gain from two up uh, because of those legality constraints. A lot of the things you might propose maybe maybe illegal. Um, maybe that means you don't want to do two up. You instead just want to do the first perturbation that I talked about, just swapping two two intersections, you know, a pickup or a delivery. Maybe it means you want to do a two op and then have a little bit of a re-legalizer. So maybe the main reason that uh, your perturbations are being rejected is because you have some pickups or some drop-offs before you picked up the package. Well, you could write code to legalize that by saying, well, if that happens, I'm going to swap the order, I'm going to shift one or something. Uh, so there are a lot of different perturbation operators you can come up with. Uh, and and some of them work much better than others. It's very hard to say in advance what's going to work the best, so it's good to just experiment. Uh, for this milestone, it's, it's a milestone where you can get a basic solution going and then actually have each team member go off and just try different things and uh, just keep track of what is working well and what isn't and combine the best ideas and submit it. Um, again, there's no real canned answer of this is for sure the best. Okay, so any questions on that? All right, so let me talk a little more about uh, iterative algorithms and escaping local minima. Okay, so I've talked about two different perturbation operators. So a simpler one, which just exchanges, you know, the order of two intersections, you know, where do they occur in this courier solution uh, versus two op, which basically takes entire pieces of the solution uh, and, and reconnects them in a different order. All right, so let's look at, you know, why, what are some of the, the the reasons that a more powerful perturbation operator like two opt can be useful. So let's say we're in this state and I'm not marking what's a pickup and drop off here. I'm just marking uh, kind of intersections that we need to go through to make it simpler. So we start at this depot, we go through a whole bunch of intersections, uh, end up at this depot. And it's a pretty reasonable solution. Uh, we have a couple of long travel paths here and here, but otherwise we're kind of going a pretty short distance between all of our intersections. So it looks pretty good. Uh, so if we're trying to improve this, let's say we, we're trying to improve it by an iterative algorithm. So we're going to look at a, uh, an intersection and we're going to try to swap it with some other intersection in the order. Okay, so let's say we take this intersection and we try to swap it with that intersection. We're going to do them in the opposite order. Okay, so what happens? If we do that, this is the result. And it's worse. Um, instead of having a couple of long travel times, we now have one, two, uh, three, four long travel times. So this wasn't a good change. Um, so maybe we can't improve this at all. And in fact, if you look at swapping the order of any two deliveries here, none of them will improve it. Okay, so we're in what's called a local minimum no swapping of two deliveries can make it better. It can only make it worse. So your iterative exchange algorithm would basically say, I'm done. I can't find anything to, uh, to improve. I've tried it all. Okay, but if you have a bigger perturbation, you can get out of that local minimum. So let's say we're looking at two ops. Okay, so two ops, again, 
basically cut edges. So they kind of disconnect pieces of the solution. It says, I still want to go through these three first. I do want to go through these ones next. And I want to go through these ones at the end, but I'm not actually sure how to put them together. Let's try to put those together in a different order than what we had before. Okay, so we've cut the path into three pieces. And there are a few ways we could reconnect it. So we could reconnect it by saying, well, I'll go from here to there. And then I'll go from here to there. And it's now reconnected. Clearly, this doesn't, this only makes sense if we say that this piece is reversed. If we reverse the order that we go through these, we wind up with what's called a tour. We've gone through all of the intersections uh, in some order. So we have to reverse the order we go through those. But that is a valid uh, order. Again, if I ignore pick up and drop off, I just say I need to go through all of these things. Okay, but it's worse. Okay, so this actually has even longer edges than we had before, so it's not better. Uh, but there are other ways we could reconnect these. So we could reconnect these three pieces by going from here to here, and then from here to here. Again, we have to reverse that piece, and we have to fix up our depots, right? So having a depot at, in the middle of the path doesn't make sense, so we have to put it on the end again. Um, this one actually is better. So we now went from two long travel paths to only having one. This is kind of our only long travel path, so it's a better solution. Uh, and we needed that more powerful perturbation operator to get to this. Um, so with a more powerful perturbation operator where you can change more things, you can get out of local minima better. This is kind of a balancing act here. If your perturbation operator is very slow, it takes a really long time to figure out what to do, you might not be able to try very many perturbations. Um, so that's a trade-off. Um, also, if your perturbation operator, again, just changed everything, then it really starts turning back into multi-start. It just destroyed the entire previous solution. So you probably don't want your perturbation operator to be that destructive, uh, but there's a wide space to explore in between those things. Uh, so any questions on that? All right, so I'm going to go to the last thing I was going to talk about today, which is how to represent this. So, so far I've been kind of drawing this on, on slides, which is not what you put into code. So how do we represent this solution so you can actually write code to uh, change it, to evaluate the quality or the travel time, et cetera? Uh, well, let's, look, let's first look at what you have to return. So your final answer that your courier subpath function has to return looks like this. Uh, or courier path function has to return looks like this. You return a vector of what are called courier subpaths. So each piece of that vector is a start intersection, an end intersection, um, a list of street segment IDs to get in between them. So just like your milestone three uh, path solution. And then one last thing, which is what items would you like to pick up at the start intersection? Okay, sometimes there won't be anything to pick up, but if your start intersection is a, a pickup intersection um, that, that has delivery four, um, that's where you pick it up, then you might say, I want to pick up delivery four. So you might store my pickup index is four. That there sometimes could be multiple things you can pick up in an intersection. So maybe four and eight, uh, deliveries four and eight, both can be picked up there. You might say, I want to pick them both up. In some cases, you may say, I don't want to pick them both up because it makes my truck too full. So this is kind of a detailed thing that your algorithm needs to set. Okay, so what does this actually look like? So again, you've got a vector of these. So each of them is the path from one interesting intersection to another interesting intersection. So let's say our start intersection is 53. Uh, our inter end intersection is 28. So this might be a, a pickup intersection. This might be a drop-off intersection. And in between, there's the path of street segments that you used to get there. So a vector of street segment IDs. And then you might have said, I'm not picking anything up here. So maybe this was a drop-off intersection. Uh, so your pickup indices is empty. Maybe you said, I'm picking up delivery two. So this was a pickup Hi, intersection. Everyone. Yeah. Uh, sorry for the interruption. Uh, just uh, to clarify, this unsigned is from last year. This, this all should be in. So one student was asking about it. So. Oh, OK, yeah. Sorry, I have to update the slide then. I owe you a chocolate bar, uh, Abbott. Yeah, we got rid of the unsigned and changed them to int. Unsigned just means unsigned integer. 
Uh, so thanks. Okay, so this year you'll see that as int basically means the same thing. So let's say the start intersection um, was, let's say there were two things we could pick up there and we wanted to pick them both up. So maybe we pick up deliveries two and five at that intersection. So then our pickup indices would have a little more in it. Uh, and that might be all we could possibly pick up because there are no other deliveries that are at that start intersection. So that's what we actually have to eventually return, not just one of these courier subpaths, but a whole vector of them. So that's what one of those courier subpaths looks like. Okay, so we could use that as our solution representation. Um, and every time we evaluate a different delivery order, we actually have to change a lot of things because this is a pretty detailed representation. So if we look at what this looks like um, on a graph or on our map, uh, it, it's kind of got everything, right? So we, we have all these little street segments recorded to go between these various intersections. Um, so that could be what we actually store as we're optimizing, okay? And this green line that I'm showing here is one courier subpath, okay? So it went from this intersection to this intersection and it had all these street segments uh, that you followed, okay? So the actual final solution is a whole bunch of these courier subpaths in a vector. Okay, so we could use that as our solution representation as we're optimizing, and optimizing means evaluating different orders, but it's kind of inconvenient because it's a, a little bit of a complicated, overly detailed representation. So it's going to take us longer to change it whenever we want to evaluate a different delivery order. So we don't really need to have such a detailed representation until the very end. We can just kind of fill the details in right when we're returning our solution. So a better idea is that while we're optimizing, while we're choosing the order of pickups and drop-offs and so on, we just store the order of, of the deliveries, of the pickups and drop-offs. And then we'll turn that into a, a full solution, meaning we have all the street segment IDs, we have all those details, only when we have to return the final answer. Okay, so what does that look like? So this is my representation of the solution. All right, so this solution, we started at this depot. This depot is index zero. Uh, then we went to the pickup with index zero, then we went to the drop off with index zero, then the pickup with index one, pickup with index three, drop off with index three, and so on. Okay, so how can we store that? Um, we could just have a vector of, I'm gonna call something pick or drop. So I'm gonna make a, a little structure called pick or drop, and I'm gonna make a vector of those things and call that the delivery order. Okay, so pick or drop could just be, uh, an integer that is which pick up, which pick up or drop off number are you, and a boolean that says are you a pick up or drop off. So that'd be perfectly fine. I could have a vector of those, and now that could store that I have this solution. I have the pick up number zero. I have the drop off number zero. So that's this and this. I have the pick up number one. I have the drop pick up number three. I have the drop off number three, and so on. So this vector perfectly stores my delivery order. And it's pretty small. It's just a vector of a pretty simple uh, data structure, um, a Boolean for whether you're a pickup or drop off, and an integer, which is what is your ID. Um, does that make sense? OK, so I'm going to take the silence uh, as yes, <laughs> but weigh in if you have any questions on this. Uh, OK, what about depots? So should I store the depots in that solution as well? Okay, so you can see in this delivery order, I haven't said anything about, you know, which depot do I go to? And you can see that when I drew this out, I actually started at depot zero and I ended at depot two, but that's not actually in my delivery order. I haven't recorded that anywhere. Should I record that in this delivery order? Which is, you know, kind of the optimization structure that I'm gonna use, that I'm going to be constantly modifying. So eventually, clearly when I return the answer, I have to put the depots in. But what do you think? Should I keep them in there while I'm optimizing? You know, evaluating, swapping different uh, deliveries and pickups and so on, or, or not? Okay, so I'm gonna tell you my answer. So 
you could store them, right? I could basically say I'll have a vector of pickups, drop-offs, or depots. So instead of having a Boolean now that says, are you a pickup or a drop-off, I might have uh, just a little type that says, you are a pickup, a drop-off, or a depot. And what is your index? And now my delivery order looks a little longer. And it starts at depot zero, ends on depot two, and in between it has these pickups and drop-offs. So that'll work fine. You could do that. Um, but you don't have to do it. Uh, it turns out that the depots, if you, if you know what order you're going to pick up and drop off things in, you can always find the best depot to start at and the best depot to end at. Um, so if I just erased this from my solution and erase that from my solution, and I went through and, uh, and tried all sorts of perturbations, I can also always figure out which depot should I start at by just saying I should always start at the depot that's closest to whatever the start of my path is, and I should end at whichever depot is closest to the end of my path. So I don't actually have to store them in the in this solution that I'm optimizing. I should take into account the fact that there is some travel time to and from the depots, but I don't have to put them in the solution representation. So I could just remove them from the vector and just store the pickups and drop offs in that delivery order if I want. Now my travel time function should understand that you do have to actually start and end at a depot. So it should fill in which depot would I use and what would the travel time be. Um, but it's probably a little easier not to store them in this solution representation and just have the travel time function fill in which would be the best one and what would your total travel time be. Does that make sense? Anyone have any questions on that? Okay, so I'm about to end. Actually, that is the very last slide. But this basically gives you an idea of how to uh, store your solution so that you can rapidly perturb it. If you can basically quickly change the order of these uh, deliveries and drop-offs and quickly evaluate what is the resulting travel time and is it legal or not, then you can try a lot of perturbations, um, hundreds of thousands, millions in that 45 seconds, and hopefully get a better answer. And uh, on Thursday, I'll show you with this representation what is what are these perturbations that we just talked about, like swapping uh, two pickups or drop offs or doing a two opt? What does that actually mean when we want to change this, this uh, representation? Uh, and it can be pretty directly coded to modify this representation and be quite fast. So we'll talk about that on Thursday. Uh, I'll stay on the line in case there are any questions. Does anybody so weigh in if you have any questions on this or Milestone 3 or anything else. And I think Dr. Tallman is on the line. So if you have any questions about communication things, you can ask him as well. Uh, other than that, thanks, everybody. If you have no questions, you're done. If you have questions, stay on the line. I'll be myself or Dr. Tallman or Abbott would be happy to answer anything that you ask. So I see a question, are there gonna be office hours? I guess send me an email uh, and I can always meet with, uh, meet with you when you would like. Um, if there's a desire for kind of general office hour and, just, and discussion, I could do that too. Uh, how many people would be interested in sort of a general office hours with uh, just various people show up and ask questions? Uh, Cause I can do that, but if there's not a general desire for it, then just send me an email and set something up.